it's always interesting uh, when you're up here on stage with the bright lights is with choroideremia. Suddenly it's like night blind. So, okay, where did the microphone go? So next up is Dr. Stacy Hume. And Dr. Stacy Hume is going to give us a, a bit of insight into a study that um, we, we, uh, we believe is unique, but maybe not quite as unique. It's the story of uh, an examination of uh, uh, brothers, um, one who has very strong CHM um, uh, symptoms, and another brother, both of which have the same genetic mutation and are not, uh, the older one is not showing uh, as many or very little of the symptoms. Uh, so Dr. Hume, if you'd like to step up, thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if you're all cold. Yes. Welcome to Canada. This is exactly what it's like. <laughs> and I have to admit, it's so cold right now where I'm from in Edmonton with Dr. McDonald that I packed only winter clothes. And I got out of the car yesterday and went, what was I thinking? Anyways, I was thinking about this air-conditioned room is what I was thinking. Cause <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about my background so you know how I got into this. I actually run a lab that does the genetic testing. And so I'm one of those ladies that interprets those results. And I'm going to start by answering the question from the last one, which was the lady that asked about the, why they couldn't. There is no good reason. <laughs> I can't, I've done lots of women for X-linked disorders. It is easy. Maybe it was a long time ago, but we run women all of the time and we can tell your two X chromosomes. So I would suggest either finding another lab or sending it in again, but there is absolutely no reason why we can't diagnose a woman with an X-linked disorder. So I'm going to tell you today about a project that I'm particularly excited about and I'm hoping to get all of you excited about. So really it was, as most things in science are, a lucky discovery. So we had an individual that had been diagnosed by Dr. Sang um, and he had traditional um, crideremia. However, when they went to do his genetic testing, they found a variant that was not so easy to predict what it was doing. And so he was told, we're not sure. We're not sure if this is actually causing the disease. So this patient actually reached out to Dr. Ian McDonald, hoping he could possibly do some work to clarify whether this variant indeed caused his choroideremia. So before we talk about um, this variant, I want to introduce what mutations are. And first of all, I'm going to start by saying we don't call them mutations anymore. We call them variants. They decided years ago that mutations really has a negative connotation and that when you say somebody has, carries a mutation or that you're a mutant, it didn't sound very good. And frankly, we all carry mutations. And so we really needed to make it more neutral and call them variants. So now, um, although I will use the word mutations because that is traditionally the word that people associate with something that is deleterious, we are now really trying to shift to calling them variants and describing them as either benign or pathogenic. So. When we look at what a variant is, we have to look at our DNA, which is present in every cell in the body. And so in my illustration, I have shown you double-stranded DNA present in every cell in the body. And this is why we can test um, a cheek swab or we can test blood. We sometimes do genetic testing on urine. We can do genetic testing on just about every tissue in your body. From DNA, our body converts it into a very unstable molecule called RNA. RNA is easily degraded. We don't keep it around in our bodies for long, and that's how our bodies control how much um, protein that we, we make, how much of the product we need. This is why our arms only grow to a certain length, because our RNA degrades when our arm has reached the appropriate length. This is why when we do forensics testing, they test DNA. They can't test RNA because it degrades right away. So I describe RNA as that intermediate that really is the manual, the how to make a body or how to make a cell. 
RNA then goes to making a protein. And what I have drawn is a picture of um, construction vehicles because really that's, these are the doers in our body. These are the proteins that actually perform functions in our body. So why isn't DNA the final manual? Well, we heard this morning that the process of making our instruction manual, RNA, is a process called splicing. So what I have up here is a very long gibberish um, um, word that starts with step one and then doesn't make sense. There's a lot of um, letters after that. However, if we remove three chunks of this gibberish that I have, you can see that we generate something that makes sense. It would be step one, screw bucket onto roof. However, if we introduce a stop here, which most individuals with croteremia have, these stop mutations, we now stop that RNA, that instruction manual, early, and it says step one, screw bucket, stop. So we now have a bucket that is not screwed into our machinery and is just hanging around. Because our instruction manual came to a very early end, the end product is not useful to the cell, and our bodies destroy that instruction manual early. So we actually don't even go on to make the bucket. Usually the RNA is completely destroyed. And our bodies do this as a defense mechanism because we don't want strange proteins finding new functions in our body. So our bodies have come up with ways of making sure that we don't, not only do we lose a function, but then acquire a new function, because that would be like a double hit to your body. Not only would you lose CHM, but CHM could take on a new, a new function and, and do something even more damaging. So what our bodies do is they destroy the RNA. So there is another type of mutation. We call these splice mutations. This is where we introduce a variant that causes our instruction manual to piece together improperly. So in my example here of my gibberish, I have removed pieces and now I'm left with step one, screw bucket onto roof. And I have wound up with a protein, a digger, that has the bucket attached to the roof. Clearly this isn't going to function properly and it is not going to do what it was intended to do. This is what we would call a splice mutation. Now let's go back to our patient. We knew that our patient did not carry this nonsense or stop mutation. So we hypothesized that possibly it could affect splicing, which is a more rare variant and harder to predict. And when we don't know what a variant does, we will often ask for other family members to come in. So that's precisely what we did. We knew that this individual had an unaffected brother, and so we thought, well, if this is certainly causing his croteremia, then his unaffected brother will not have this. So let's just test his unaffected brother. So on a, an eye exam, we saw that indeed everybody was falling into line. We had a, an unaffected brother whose image is on the right, and we had our patient whose image is on the left with, with very little RPE left. However, when we did the genetic testing, we found that the unaffected brother carried the exact same splice mutation as our affected male. And I remember the technologist that works for both Dr. Ian McDonald and myself sitting there at, at the table going, holy, this is very significant. This means that one brother has biologically overcome croideremia himself he has somehow managed to cure himself. We need to look into this further because nature has given us the answer to the cure. We, we can't let this go. So we recognize that this was probably the only case ever identified of CHM that is completely clinically discordant 
given the patient's age. So the patient's in his 40s and still has full vision. So given that he has cured or at least partially cured himself to this point, we don't know what the future is going to hold in 10 or 20 years, whether he will lose some vision. But as of right now, because he doesn't have the typical phenotype that he should have, we hypothesize that he has gained this ability. So it's we are hypothesizing that it is the opposite of CHM, which is the loss of function. We think this individual gained a new function and is able to overcome the mutation that he has. So we do know the players in the CHM pathway. We know that the gene or the DNA is called CHM. Normally, our protein is named the same. The gene is usually italicized, and the protein is usually not but it is not named the same thing in CHM. The protein, or the part that does the work in the body in CHM, is called REP1. So the job of REP1 is analogous to hanging a flag. Um, this morning we heard putting the hat on. So the job is to flag another protein called RAB27A. And I describe it as the equivalency of hanging a sign on a building. When you add a sign to a building, you can direct traffic to the right location. So we have our RAB27A as the building, and we've got our little Rep1, who's a woman with a hammer, and she's going, why did my parents name me Rep1? So the first step is that we realized we needed the unaffected brother's samples. We preferred the cells because then we could do a lot of different exper experiments with them and we could grow them in culture. And then we could look at both the RNA, the DNA of course, and the protein. Because RNA is unstable, as I've said, it's very difficult to ship RNA. By the time it makes it to a lab, it's degraded, it's gone. We can get DNA shipped, but we can't get RNA. So getting samples proved especially difficult because as we were beginning this project is when COVID hit. And this brother lives in Spain. So we managed, it, it was quite a significant delay because we had to do a lot of paperwork to get him to the United States, but we managed to use CRF money to fly him to New York where he underwent another exam and we managed to get cells. So our hypothesis number one was that the unaffected brother somehow gained the ability to rescue his splicing. And so we um, looked into this and our very first, um, in our graph, our very first um, bar here is our control. And the next two are the brothers. So you can see that we were completely wrong. He does have abnormal splicing. He doesn't look any different than his affected brother. They have CHM expression to about 0.5%, which is a little bit, but not a lot. So both brothers produce RNA that is the same but smaller size. So the first part of my figure here is showing that the beginning of the, of the protein starts off fine, and then at the end, both of them produce something that is smaller. They look the same. Okay, throw that hypothesis away. Let's go with a second hypothesis. Perhaps the unaffected brother had more protein. So we were thinking, okay, the RNA doesn't look good, but that 0.5% that he was making, maybe it's hanging around a little bit longer and that has preserved his vision. So we ran a gel to look at the REP1 protein. And in, by the yellow arrow, you can see our control, beautiful protein at the top. Nope, no protein in both affected and unaffected brothers. So wrong. Hypothesis number two, not correct. So we started looking at more potential players. In your body, as you know, there are two proteins with similar function, REP1 and REP2. REP2 is long thought to not participate in the, um, the hanging of the flag in the retinal pigment epithelial cells, but we thought perhaps in the unaffected brother, 
Rep2 is produced in higher amounts and the little bit of activity that maybe by overproducing it could fill in for the lack of Rep1. Result was no. Rep2 is present in the same amount in both brothers. Of course, this does not rule out Rep2 levels could be different in the retina because neither brother wants us to sample their retina for some reason. And so we are doing this on um, fibroblast cells and lymphocytes. So we can see here in our control sample um, that it's not statistically different. Our affected and unaffected brother do not have elevated amounts of Rep2 protein. Hypothesis four. Perhaps the activity of Rep1 is replaced in the unaffected male. So does the unaffected brother still have the activity that Rep1 does because he's still hanging that flag up by some other protein that's never been discovered? Is the hanging of the flag still happening? This hanging of the flag is a complicated process called prenylation. So we did an assay that measured how many buildings, um, and in science language, we call those Rab proteins that don't have flags, so not prenylated. So you do not want to see a band here. And we can see our control. We are missing the two bands in the middle. That is what we should look like. There is basically no difference between the affected and the unaffected brother. They are still missing the flags. Okay, we're on to hypothesis six. The unaffected brother possibly has another variant that improves or replaces the damaged Rep1. So we sent both brothers off for whole genome sequencing. This produces literally thousands of variants. Um, we've looked into a couple thus far, but so far none ap appear promising. Part of the issue is that we have thousands of variants to sift through. So our corollary of hypothesis six is that some individuals have variants that give them great vision, very healthy RPE. And there's a big problem with this very likely scenario. Variants are common. They make us individuals. I inherited the short lady variant that I curse my mother for every day. Um, I have green eyes, I love those. Um, I can't curl my tongue. So we all carry variants. Um, and we notice or discover those variants that don't function properly. But if someone has great vision, we don't send them off for whole genome sequencing to find out why you have great vision. So you don't get genetic testing if you have great vision. You only get genetic testing if you have poor vision. So how are we going to figure out if there are variants that make people have exceptionally healthy RPE and that can overcome CHM? And my thought on this is also that those female carriers that have differences in expression that some, some are affected and some aren't is probably because they have some common variant that's present in a lot of people that gives them healthy RPE for longer. It's probably exactly what we're seeing in our unaffected brother, that they carry something very common that I may even have, but we wouldn't know because Nobody cares that I have exceptionally good vision. So now we're looking for the needle in the haystack, somewhat. Although it's not really a haystack because we do know the players in criteremia. So this is called, when we start looking for the exact players, gene ontology mapping. We want to find software, and I think it does exist, it's just a matter of searching it out that examines variants in the context of a known pathway. We don't care about the variants that are in genes that are not even expressed in the eye. We don't care about the height of the brothers. We don't want to know if the brothers are going to get cancer one day. We don't want to know any of that. We want to look at specific genes that are expressed in the eye and ignore all of the others. 
So this complicated pathway that I put up just shows you that we know the pathway for croideremia, so we kind of know where to look. There's still going to be lots of variants to examine here, but we know where to start looking. So this is the next step. Hypothesis seven, while we were sending um, our brothers off to get whole genome sequencing, it takes quite a while before it comes back, uh, my brilliant technologist, Alina, was reading some papers and discovered that there was a natural compound which seemed to affect splicing. So she decided to ask the question, would this particular compound fix the splicing of this particular variant? So her conclusion after she treated um, our patient cells with this compound was that it does increase the expression of CHM. We were quite shocked. So we are now in discussions with that drug company just to see um, if, if they will maybe fund some more studies on looking at um, treating some forms of rare diseases, including CHM that have the lack of splicing, with this natural drug that's, that's uh, not synthetic at all. So our conclusions are that we have discovered an individual who has naturally overcome the deficit seen with a CHM gene mutation. This likely represents a gain of function variant, which are very difficult to figure out. Our next steps are going to be to use gene ontology mapping to look for a list of potential variants. And we also wish to do RNA sequencing, which is tricky because RNA degrades, but it allows us to see what the expression level differences would be between both boys, um, one that's affected and one that isn't. There must be something there that's different between the two of them. Once we have some prospective candidates, we're going to work on a measurable assay. For example, if we find a variant that causes REP2 to be expressed and functional in the eye, whereas normally it's not, then can we introduce this variant into the cells from the affected brother? Is there a way to get REP2 to compensate for REP1? Everyone here has a functioning REP2. If we could get REP2 to function instead of the damaged REP1, that would represent a natural cure. Um, so as we knew that this work was coming along, we also developed specialized cells from the affected brother that we can force to develop into those retinal pigment epithelial cells, those IPSCs that we were talking about. We've made those. So we are ready to do some functional work on those cells as soon as we identify some um, candidates. So I have some big thank yous, my brilliant tech, Elena, um, and then Dr. Ian McDonald, because we've worked hand in hand for a number of years, him doing the clinical diagnosis, me being in the lab doing the genetic testing, as well as investigating patients for whom we could find no CHM mutation. Um, and of course, most importantly, the CRF uh, Foundation for, and the donors who have allowed us to do this work. We are incredibly excited and we really do think that when we figure out what the difference is between these two brothers that we will have identified a natural cure that biology has done all by itself. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I know this is, this is an amazing uh, uh, concept and Dr. Hume, let me ask you this: uh, Many of us, uh, as patients, when we go to see our eye doctor and get a clinical diagnosis, only the siblings that show symptoms get genetically tested. So, it, what are the possibilities that we have more of these uh, interesting siblings out there, or is it this very? unique mutation that you you found? I, I think, unfortunately, it probably is a unique mutation. You know, I know when Dr. McDonald was first cloning the gene and looking for it, he did studies on hundreds, of, like, well, lots of family members. Um, when we look for a gene to begin with, we have to do a lot of unaffected people. And so he would have done a lot of testing. He did a lot of testing on unaffected people. The other thing about this one is that 
because it's a splice mutation and it's not a nonsense and there is like 0.5% expression, it makes it just a little bit different. Um, I don't think it'll be different down the road for what, what caused the vision in the affected male, but I do think the fact that we have found this is a little bit different than if you've got a full-on stop mutation. That being said, you're right, we don't test um, unaffected males. Genetic testing is expensive. We don't want to discover variants that aren't relevant. So we generally just don't do testing on unaffected males. There is one other case report of this variant in Brazil, um, which I had mentioned last time I gave a talk. And notably in that paper, the family has no um, family history of CHM. So um, we are working on reaching out to them and seeing if we can get samples because it could be that the lack of family history is that with this particular variant that there are other, there's other members that have naturally cured themselves, which would sure help when you're studying because if we can um, it find the same variant that um, fixed the eyesight in that family, then presumably it's you know more widespread and easier to, to discover. Yep. Can you wait for uh, the microphone to get to you? Do we have a, is there a volunteer out there with it? Um, so he has an older brother that is not exhibiting any problems at all. Would you not suggest us to get him checked? I mean, if, if by chance we could find a roundabout way to do that, would that be a good idea or not? Typically I would say no, because I think the chances, I think this is honestly quite, a lucky finding and I don't expect that we will find a lot of people or any pe people out there that have a mutation but have eyesight. Okay. I, I really do think that this is rare and it's probably not worth like looking at everyone to see if this is happening. Um, but that being said, I, I can't stress enough that I don't think the mutation has anything to do with why because everything that we're seeing from our results, these brothers look identical. They're, they're not any bit different. Neither one of them has protein. So I don't think that the reason that he has vision, the unaffected brother, has anything to do with the strange mutation. Because by all means, everything that we're seeing is identical. He has something else that's causing him to have better vision, good vision. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? We're up against the break, and I appreciate it. One, one quick question, yes. Eric. Uh, thank you very much, by the way, for the presentation. This is great. Um, I know, obviously, trying to find another individual with a CHM mutation who has normal vision is finding the second needle in a haystack. Um, but is there any benefit of having additional affected CHMers um, provide whole genome sequencing um, to sort of try to eliminate some of the noise in, in your variant analysis or might that actually generate more noise? Yeah, no, it wouldn't help yet, but what I've been asking Dr. McDonald for is there CHMers that have different rates of progression or different starting points? Because if we do find another variant um, in this individual that has preserved his eyesight and you were to be a CHMer, I would predict that if you carried this variant that your eyesight was preserved later than others. And so this is what I'm pushing Dr. McDonald for. If he sees anybody that's a little bit discordant, that we remember that and later go back to their sample to see if they have any, um, have this variant present in them. Thank that, you. That, by the way, is Dr. Chris Moen, who is one of the most unique CHMers in that he mapped his own DNA at Gene Bennett's lab. Wow. <laughs> you make me blush, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Stacy, um, hi, I'm Vicky, and thank you. It was very, very interesting. I want to tell you that we also have a family um, where the uncle has a mutation. He's affected. His sister is a carrier, and she has a son, and he has the mutation, and he's not affected. Ooh. So there is a second family, um, and we think it's to do with the splicing and, and the same we look through the fibroblasts and the splicing is the same for both of them the the son and the um the pro uh, the patient yeah and the uncle and 
our hypothesis is perhaps that because we know splicing can be a little bit different from tissue to tissue. Yeah. So we've done the IPSC. We're going to be doing the RPE to see if by chance uh, the splicing in the in the retina actually varies at that level. So um, it's kind of interesting, and I think we should be in touch. I think so I think too. It could be something that could be you know there might be information. That I could agree, help and the I think other. If, if we could do RNA seq on both of them, I think that also we could maybe see what's being expressed. Yeah in both of those individuals. Yeah, exactly. I, I completely and agree. this is why we bring the researchers together. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. think, I, I think that's about I, it. Do we have more. any other questions? Yeah. If uh, It's more. up to Dr. I, I had one, one, one quick question. Yeah. Given the, and that was a fascinating talk, thank you. Um, given the potential role of epigenetics, can you comment on any differences in environmental exposure for the brothers? Um, I, I, the patient is here, so he might know if there was any environmental differences growing up. Okay. Um, however, you're right, epigenetics could play a role, but I, especially now with a second case, I, I, I think that's probably unlikely, and I think it's probably more likely that it's something that he, he was born with, that he that he has a, a, another protein or something that's causing splicing to either work in the retina or to fill in the gaps and function for REP1. Thank you. So Eric, I have one quick question from the internet and we'll call it, we'll call it after that. It says, uh, this is from Nanma, if you'll find a potential cure variant, will it suit splicing variants only or other types of variants as well? No, we're hoping that we're hoping that if we find something, it will not just be for splicing. We're hoping that we can find something that would work on, on CHM and REP1 or the pathway in general, that it's something to do with the pathway. Yeah, that's, that's the thought of, of the Science Advisory Board when we made the investment in this research grant was the hopes were that if there is a certain type of protein that there may be some sort of neuroprotective agent or other um, potential of enhancing that protein in, in the rest of us to help uh, sustain more life within the cells. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Dr. Hume. Thank you for coming from Canada. We greatly appreciate it.